go right in Knoxville. So we are recording this Zoom so people can watch it later if you miss the live. We can increase our reach that way and more people can learn the right way to recycle in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I'm assuming all systems are go. We are recording, we are live on Facebook, and we are here on Zoom. My name is Jeffrey Berry. I am the host of today's webinar. I am the CEO of Tennessee Environmental Council. And I'll just share briefly with you who we are as an organization and uh, what our mission and our goals and our vision are for the state of Tennessee and beyond. It's a global environment. So Tennessee Environmental Council was founded in 1970. And uh, our mission is to engage individuals and communities to improve our environment and public health. Um, so we have a vision for Tennessee and that vision includes thriving habitats, a circular economy and climate balance in Tennessee. And the middle one, the, the second of those three is a circular economy and that's the focus of our presentation today. So the way our economy works right now predominantly is a linear economy. So linear, we draw resources out of the earth to make the products we use, we process them through manufacturing and turn them into products like uh, nice little glass jars um, or plastic containers for produce and uh, things like that. So um, that's the linear economy. And then what do we do when we're done with those things? We throw them in the trash and they go to a landfill and that's the linear economy. So we draw it from the earth, we make things, we use them, we throw them in the earth and we bury them. And it's not sustainable. It's not how nature um, works. There's no waste in nature. So there are ways to do things better. And that's why recycling it. And we're probably preaching to the choir here for, uh, um, for the most part, because if you're watching this, you already care about recycling and how to do it right. And so congratulations, thank you for caring. And, but there are better ways because when you recycle materials and when you, instead of just throwing it in the trash and burying it in the landfill, you create jobs. And if you recycle through your curbside in Knoxville or your local convenience centers, those materials are being remanufactured into new products. And, uh, and so that's creating jobs. It's reducing the amount we have to pull out of the earth through massive mining operations and reduces the amount of energy. So it cleans up our environment in many ways. And so that's why we are encouraging recycling. And uh, the thing about recycling is that if you throw the wrong things in your curbside cart, it basically hampers the entire process. So that's called contamination. If you put stuff in your cart that cannot be recycled in your local infrastructure, then that stuff needs to be pulled off the recycling line and it would most likely just go straight to the landfill. So people think often think they're recycling um, and then those things are going to the landfill anyway. So if you're gonna take the time and effort to recycle, it takes just a little bit more thought to make sure you're doing it right. Uh, and that's the focus of our presentation, our webinar today. We have two wonderful guests who are experts in this and are leaders in your community in Knoxville. We have Patience, um, who is a waste and resources manager for the city of Knoxville. And Patience has a really good presentation for you uh, on how to recycle in Knoxville and, and uh, a lot of good information. And we also have Michaela who founded um, Knoxville, which is a local refill store and it's uh, currently it's um, an online store and you uh, can, you will, well, she'll explain after Patience does her presentation. So uh, that's who we have today. And, and you can all participate in reducing the amount of materials that, are, that you're using on a daily basis by reusing and refilling um, the, the products in, that you use every day. And, and that's what Michaela will talk to you about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Patience. Um, with um, the city of Knoxville. So, like I said, Patience Melnick is the Waste and Resources Manager for the city of Knoxville on, and has a presentation on recycling right in Knoxville. And um, Patience came to the city of Knoxville in 2017, but before that, she worked for the nonprofit organization Keep Knoxville Beautiful, and before that, Tennessee Clean Water Network. So, uh, Patience has a good long history and track record and career in um, environmental work and taking care of our environment. So um, Patience has a lot of great experience and she's going to share that with you today. Um, so take it away, Patience. All right. 
um, try and share here. Bear with me. Oops. And I'll disappear so I can just watch. Okay. All right. I'm ho hoping everybody can see this. Is everybody able to see the slideshow stuff? Anybody? Well, we can. I think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> great. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeff, for that uh, great introduction. Um, and you're right. I do have a background in um, environmental nonprofits. And honestly, everybody in our office um, at the Waste and Resources Management Office at the city is really actually very passionate about um, the sustainability side of proper waste management. And of course, a big part of that um, is recycling. So I'm thrilled to talk with you all today and um, just spread this information and grateful that you're taking time out of your day to, to learn more. Um, so just a quick overview of the presentation. I'm just gonna um, talk very briefly about our office and all the services that we provide, a little bit about the recycling operations um, that we offer and our waste snapshot. I think it's always important to kind of view recycling as just a piece of, um, of your whole waste profile. So get it in context. Um, and then we'll dive into the state of recycling and that will include a little bit of history so we can kind of better understand where we are today with recycling systems. Um, recycling is a business and it works um, when it's profitable and only when it's profitable, frankly. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the financial side of recycling and kind of understanding that piece I think can take a little bit of the mystery um, and the, a little bit of the frustration out of, of this thing that we all do because we love the environment and we want to do better for the planet. Um, so, but it's always important to be mindful of that aspect of it. Uh, we'll also talk about where um, your recyclables go once you put them in your bin here in Knoxville, where, where do they end up? Um, some do's and don'ts. And then we'll touch on a kind of some confusing issues as of late in our community, number three through seven's plastics and glass, of course, and then um, the environmental benefits of recycling. We all know that it's beneficial, but just a little bit deeper look at, at why it is beneficial. Um, so our office, um, we're in the downtown building, city county building, and um, we manage the solid waste facility, which is on Elm Street. You may know it, some people call it the dump. It's a transfer station, people can take waste there and it's um, packed into semis and then transported to two different landfills. Um, that facility also houses our household hazardous waste facility. And um, it's really an underutilized facility. Um, and it's a place where you can take all kinds of things that you, know, you might pause and think, can I really put this battery or these electronics or this used oil or these chemicals that have been in my grandma's basement for decades. Can I really put them in my trash? Um, often the answer is no, they should go to the household hazardous waste facility. So we encourage you to check out our webpage on that um, for, those, for those items and, and use that facility. Um, we manage the downtown trash and recycling. Um, that's all picked up. It's picked up eight times a week by city staff. Uh, we manage a small commercial curbside garbage and recycling um, program for about 300 businesses. Um, we also manage um, about 60,000 households, um, curbside garbage, and then a little over half of our households are also signed up for the recycling. So that's about 31,000. Um, we manage the five uh, recycling drop-off centers. Um, and then we also have a little fledgling program. It's a low waste restaurant program that was about to kick off right at the beginning of COVID. So we're looking forward to kind of revving that back up again. It's kind of like a modeled on the lead certified model, um, just trying to promote those businesses that are taking steps to be really responsible with their, their waste management. Um, our curbside recycling program, like I said, we have a little over half of our households signed up, um, but the carts do migrate. Not everybody puts them out. So we have that many signed up, but I wouldn't say that 50% are participating exactly. Um, we have about 1,700 new recyclers sign up per year. 
um, which is great. Um, and in 2017, when we went to an all trash cart program, um, we had a nice big bump in folks um, recycling. We had um, about twice as more than twice as many as usual. So that was great. People who wouldn't have otherwise recycling recycled um, got in the program. Um, we have the five recycling drop-off centers. These are not to be confused with the county convenience centers. Um, the county convenience centers take trash and recycling. These five centers only take recycling, but um, they are the only place where you can recycle glass um, in Knox County or really in any counties around that I know of um, so far. That green little dot you see um, is West Rock and West Rock is what we call our MRF. That's um, short for Materials Recovery Facility. And that's where all of the recyclables go to be sorted, bailed, and then sold. So that's not a function that the city does. We pay them um, to do that for us. And here are a couple pictures from West Rock, the MRF. Um, you can see the sorting line there on the left and way too many plastic bags um, gumming up the works there. Um, and then on the right, of course, the bales of material ready to um, be loaded onto trucks and then sold to regional customers to be made into new materials. Um, a quick snapshot of um, how we're kind of doing in general with our waste as compared to kind of national trends. Um, you can see that if you combine the green and the red pie pieces, we have about 9% recycling, which compared to the national average of 25% is low. We have some room to grow there. That said, our leaf and brush um, curbside program, um, which is, you know, a different kind of recycling, um, is fantastic. It's at 30% way above the national average of 10, um, which is excellent because those materials, um, when they, you know, anaerobically break down in the landfill without oxygen, they produce uh, methane, which is, of course, a, a very potent greenhouse gas, much more so than carbon dioxide. Um, so it's great that we're at least keeping that much material um, out of the landfill. And then we've got the 54% trash. Okay, so on to what, what we call the state of, of recycling. Um, you've probably heard a lot um, in the news um, in recent years about what is and isn't being recycled and China not taking our materials. So we're gonna dive um, a little bit into that big global picture kind of before um, looking closer at what we're doing here in Knoxville. So a quick history. Um, you know, recycling as we know it, as we think of it, has not really been around for that long, about 50 years, really. Um, disposable packaging really took off in a huge way in the 50s. And by the 60s and 70s, um, we had a tremendous waste and litter problem because of it. Um, because of that issue and other kind of pollution issues um, in that decade, we saw the first Earth Day, we saw the establishment of the EPA, uh, we saw the first recycling programs um, that were established really by the beverage industry who were trying to come up with a good answer to, um, to the pressure that they were receiving um, because of all of their waste. Um, in the 1980s, recycling begins in Knoxville with recycling centers. Um, and then in the 1990s, I've highlighted this in red because this was really um, the era when the recycling systems that we know today that are kind of struggling and suffering a little bit, it is when um, they were established. Um, so we're kind of, um, you know, seeing the fallout from that system that doesn't quite work as well as it did back then. Basically, back then you had these huge boats, like you see in this picture, coming from China with lots of materials to sell, um, and then going back to China empty. Um, and so it really made financial sense for us to send our recycling back on those boats. I mean, shipping was practically free. Um, and China really needed our materials so that it could keep feeding um, the really growing industry over there. And it was worth so much to them. They needed it so much. Um, it was fetching such high prices 
that at that point, that's um, when we saw the advent of the big blue recycling bin, where whereas before in communities, materials were sorted. Um, during that era, it was like, throw it all in, make it as easy as possible. Let's up the volume from residents um, for this material. Um, but of course, that introduced some confusion. It introduced, I mean, honestly, a fair amount of sort of laziness, um, sloppiness, maybe. Um, I think that we're still experiencing now. Um, but um, so 2011, we started our curbside program, as you know. Um, in 2018, all of that material that we were so kind of sloppily sending to China, um, China, by that time, you know, their, their um, industry has grown tremendously. Their economy is booming. And so they didn't want our waste anymore. Um, they had their own materials to, to recycle. Um, and so they really kind of slammed the door on taking that material in. They said no more than 0.5% contamination um, in those cargo ship containers. Um, and basically no, no recycling that you gather curbside is going to meet that standard, no matter how great that community is at recycling. Um, that's really going to just be post industrial kind of recycling. You know, there's a factory that makes a certain plastic widget and it's one kind of plastic and they might send that over and it's completely pure. Um, but it really made a lot of communities in the U S um, have no outlet for their recyclables. And that's when you saw all of these national news stories about, communities losing recycling and uh, materials being landfilled. Um, in 2019, Knox County stopped taking separated glass. Um, also in 2019, again, you see those news reports. Um, and we saw, I think the count now is close to 100 different communities um, that have had their um, recycling canceled. Um, looking forward, plastic has been added to the Basel Convention as one of those materials that can no longer be traded from American business to say, you know, a, a business in Vietnam, right? We can't, we can no longer, um, um, you know, make those transactions without the approval of those countries' governments. So um, in terms of selling those recyclables, it's even, it's becoming even harder than it was in the past. So the question, of course, I think on everybody's mind is how has that impacted us here in Knoxville? And frankly, it really, it has and it hasn't. It hasn't because traditionally we have not been selling our materials to China. We're landlocked, so it never really made sense for our community to sell it you know, to sell these materials. And when, when I say our community, I mean West Rock, of course, they're responsible for finding um, purchasers for these materials. Um, that said, there's a lot more pressure um, from those communities that have lost that outlet that can no longer sell to China. And so the competition um, is, is steeper. And so West Rock can still sell those materials to the regional buyers, but they're getting a lot less money for it. Um, which means for us as a community, we are paying West Rock more. Um, we're paying higher tipping fees. Um, so again, West Rock is our materials recovery facility. It's very close to downtown and after the pandemic is completely over and they're open back up, I highly recommend a tour there. It's a really fascinating facility. Um, and it is the only MRF in the Northeast, in Northeast Tennessee, the closest other one is down there in Chattanooga. Um, and we pay them for the material that is mixed in the curbside bin. They pay us for the material they pick up at the recycling centers. Um, and so right when all of these changes happened with China, we went from $10 a ton to the next year, $24 a ton, um, because really we needed to supplement the money that they were getting by selling these materials um, because the prices had plummeted. Um, and so now in 2021, we're up to $27 a ton for that material, which, you know, it's a big increase. And yet, if you compare at the bottom to the national average recycling tipping fee at $67, um, we're doing fine. We definitely have a very viable and healthy recycling program still. 
Um, and when you look at recycling, of course, you have to look at the alternative when you're looking at the price of all of these things. And that is, of course, landfilling. Um, we in the city, we send uh, materials to two different landfills. Your, your garbage, at, you know, if you're a city of Knoxville resident, is going to Athens, Tennessee. Um, and it's, we pay basically $20 a ton there. So it is more expensive to recycle right now than it is to landfill. Um, and then Poplar View is the second um, landfill, and that's where construction and demolition waste goes. And that's a little bit more expensive, $22 a ton. Again, compared to national average of $54 a ton, um, it, we're, we're very fortunate. Um, so you may wonder when you put items in your recycling bin where they go, and um, this is this is where they go. Um, Gerdau Mira Steel is right here in Knoxville, and they buy all of the steel. So your cat food cans, your bean cans, um, they're going right, you know, right here, right, very close to downtown. Um, Arconic in Alcoa buys all of our aluminum. Um, Mohawk Flooring, which is in North Georgia, is buying our number ones and twos. Um, and is downcycling them. Um, to be clear, it's not, plastic recycling is really tricky and for the most part it's downcycled and that's certainly the case with our plastic. Um, it's made into carpet, so it's getting that one more life um, and then no doubt is being landfilled after, you know, it's done um, as, as carpet. Um, strategic materials in Atlanta um, purchases our glass and again, that's only from the recycling centers, not from the bins. Um, and then West Rock itself, it, you know, they run the recycling facility, but their main business, they're an international packaging company. And so they buy the fibers, we call them the fibers, that's really, you know, all of your cardboard, your paperboard, your paper, um, and they are using that to feed their own mills um, to make new products. So here are some um, advanced do's and don'ts. I'm sure if you're all attending this today, you um, know kind of the basics, but a few kind of advanced do's and don'ts that I like to point out. Yes, um, pizza boxes. Um, this was not true maybe even a year ago, but about nine months ago, West Rock issued a press release um, that they wanted our pizza boxes, even if they are greasy. Um, and that is indicative of kind of how fluid recycling is. We think of it as this very set thing, but that is a result of that market for cardboard going up and up. Cardboard is really fetching really high prices right now. So it is worth it to them to go that extra step to process that grease out of that material because it's worth so much. Um, so that's a change, a recent change. Um, the lids, especially on plastic bottles, it used to be that you left them off, but now um, you can recycle them, but you want to screw them back onto the bottle. That's not true, of course, of the metal lids, which typically go on glass. Um, but the plastic lids you want to put back on it, when they're just kind of flying around, you know, just the lid itself the sorting equipment can't capture it. So you wanna make sure those go back onto the bottle. And then of course glass, there's still confusion in our community about glass um, since it was taken out at the county convenience centers and out of the curbside bins, but it is being recycled from the recycling centers. So please do bring your glass there if you can. As for no's, the, one of the biggest no's is plastic bags. And I will say, you know, the recycling sorting system is made to accommodate a certain amount of contamination, right? There are these, there are human beings working that line. There are high tech equipment sorting out all of these different materials and they can handle a certain amount of contamination. Um, but bags are not just a contaminant. They're actually harmful to the system. You can see over on the right, they really cog or uh, tangle up the cogs. So multiple times a day over at West Rock, they're shutting down the whole line, jumping in the machinery and pulling these bags out so that they can continue the line. Um, and so really what a lot of this comes down to when we're talking about contamination is not like, oh, if you put too much contamination in your recycling, it's gonna ruin everything that you're recycling. It's not exactly that straightforward. What it is is that if there's too much contamination in bales, um, if it 
if they have to slow the machines down too many times, if they have to add more people to pull this stuff out, it all decreases their bottom line. And again, we can only recycle as a community if West Rock is in the black, if they're making a profit and stay open. And so we can help, you know, we can help them ride the waves of the market going up and down and you know, doing crazy things since China shut everything down. We can help them ride that out. We can help them remain viable so that we can continue to recycle um, if we do, you know, minimize contamination and minimize harmful contamination um, like glass and like plastic bags. Um, so any bags of any kind, film, if you can wave it around and flap it around, don't put it in, rigid plastics only. Um, aluminum foil and pie pans, those um, are not recyclable. They just kind of burn up. They, in the, in the smelting process, they're too thin to be reusable. Um, coffee cups, juice, soup cartons, ice cream cartons, and freezer boxes, you, they look like paper, but they're lined with plastic, right, to contain those liquids. So those are not, those mixed um, products are often not recyclable. Styrofoam um, is a good example of, you know, styrofoam always has that little chasing arrows, number six symbol, uh, but it's not recyclable. Can it be recycled? Yes, absolutely. Many things can if they make financial sense, but styrofoam doesn't. You have to condense it back down into a hard number six plastic. Um, and it's just, it makes no financial sense to do that. So nobody does it. Um, paper towels and napkins, also not recyclable. And again, tanglers, you can see over on the right, those hoses, fishing line, whatever all that junk is, um, it's very detrimental to the system. Um, at the end of the day, the most important do's and don'ts are, yes, check the website of your local, whoever it is, in our case, municipality, or if you're out in the county, um, the county. I will say that county's materials also go to West Rock. So with the exception of glass, the rules are basically the same. Um, and that's true of surrounding counties as well. Um, on the upper right, you can see that green grid. Those are, if you visit our webpage there, the recycling webpage, you'll see all of these options. You can sign up for recycling. You can find out your service day. Um, we have a new tool. If you click on, can I recycle this? And then below there's a screenshot of this tool and you could look up individual items. So when you're like, oh, is this plastic straw recyclable? If you have a certain item in mind and you're really confused about it, you can go in there. There are hundreds of items. Our team personally wrote and edited that entire thing. And so you can find out exactly what you should do with it. I should say too, that tool is not just for recyclables. It's also for um, those mat weird materials that we take in at the household hazardous waste facility. So if you're like, oh, I have this paint, what should I do with it? Um, jump on there and type it in and you can find out exactly what your options are. Um, and I would say the big no is don't assume that the rules stay the same. They don't change that frequently, but I would say, you know, refresh your knowledge every year or at least every two or three years. Um, because the markets change and the technology changes. So we want to just not be overly confident that we know how to do it. Um, and then, of course, if you came from a different city, um, that that city might have different outlets, might have different regional purchasers, might they might have different technology at the MRF. So they will recycle different things. So it's always dependent on um, on the locality. Um, a word about wish cycling. I mean, I think most of the people who are, you know, passionate about recycling, um, we sometimes, and I'm guilty myself, sometimes tend to, you know, hope that something is recyclable when it's not. Um, I used to be one of these people. Uh, when I hear I recycle everything, I go, oh, I hope not, because um, really you want to only recycle something when you're certain it's recyclable. So we like to say when in doubt, throw it out and then give us a call to ask or look it up on our tool to ask. Um, the beverage industry started recycling and it started it for beverage containers. So, you know, if we all look around our desk right now, there's probably a ton of things made out of plastic, but most of them are not recyclable. It's really a limited number of things that are recyclable. So you want to make sure 
sure it's a yes. And unless you know it's a yes, then it's probably a no. Um, if it doesn't have a recycling symbol, do not recycle it. Um, if it does have a recycling symbol, it is not necessarily recyclable. As we've seen with styrofoam, a lot of plastic bags have a number four or a number two. Um, with the chasing arrows, they are not recyclable here in Knoxville. Um, and again, post-consumer materials are only recycled if they're cheaper than virgin materials. The caveat to that is if we as consumers assist, insist on buying uh, materials with recycled content, then we help push those manufacturers towards more, um, you know, using more recycled material, even if it might be a little more expensive for them. Um, and then, of course, um, reduce first. Um, um, a word about 337's plastics. Um, currently, there is no end buyer for the 337's plastics. Um, so, these materials, when you're when you exclude the styrofoam and the bags, really there's not a ton of it. You you may think that there is, but by weight, it only makes up about two percent of the materials that we collect in Knoxville. So not a huge deal. And unlike glass, plastic bags, and food, they don't harm the system. Um, West Rock has optical sorters that easily kind of kick out these plastics that are not recyclable and they currently are being landfilled. Um, we are hesitant to change our guidance on this because we are pursuing a couple of different possible avenues for, for purchasing these materials. Um, and so you can put them in if you want, you can leave them out. But if you do leave them out, please do check back on our website in a year or two and, um, and see if this has um, changed. Um, a quick word about glass, and I know I'm, I've run over my time by two minutes, so I'll rush through these last ones. But basically glass, um, you know, we, we love glass. It's very food safe. Um, it's a nice, heavy, beautiful material. But glass that was going in the curbside bins um, and going through that sorting line and mixing with all the weird scraps and trash and paper and plastic that are um, on that sorting line, when it comes out at the end, it looks like this picture here. It looks just like garbage and nobody wants to buy it. And if nobody wants to buy it and clean it and create something new out of it, it is ergo not recyclable. So that's why it was taken out. And again, it is one of those materials that is harmful to the system. It's hard on the equipment. It's not safe. And it was um, contaminating other materials and thus bringing down the value of those other bales. So um, that's why we made the decision years ago to take it out and to spread that word with the community. That said, um, glass, you know, different materials are more and less environmentally um, beneficial when used as recycled material. And when you're looking at the energy it takes, um, when you compare virgin glass to post-consumer glass, what it takes to make those two into a new bottle, um, there's only a savings of about 30% from glass. Whereas with paper you see higher and aluminum, you see a very, very high energy savings um, for that life cycle analysis. Um, so that, um, you know, if we're going to take one thing out of there, I, I'm, I personally am happy that it's glass because it's not as environmentally beneficial to recycle. Um, also, if you transport it more than 800 miles, that benefit is wiped out. And we are transporting it down to Atlanta, 430 miles. So there still is benefit, but not much. Um, these are um, the benefits of our recycling program. I'm going to skip over that. Um, this last slide I like to show, I'm a, you know, I am a huge um, cheerleader for recycling, but we always want to keep it in context. Um, you can see recycling there in the moderate impact area of what you can do um, to help um, with climate change and the greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, we want to recycle. It's a win-win. It's great for business. It's great for jobs. It's easy. Um, it's a lot easier than some of the other things that we can do, but we just don't want to don't want to stop there, which is why I'm really um, excited to hear what Michaela is going to talk about, because that really is the, the prevention step of that waste in the first place is by far a lot more beneficial than recycling. 
Um, quick plug, we have one AmeriCorps position open in our office. We have one filled and one still open. So if there's any fellow waste nerds out there that are interested in working with us and working with communications around these issues, please contact me. Um, and I know we're going to take questions after Michaela's uh, presentation. So I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Patience. And uh, I would like to ask you briefly, and we, by the way, for the audience out there, we will get to your Q&A, your questions. Uh, just type them in the Q&A of the Zoom or in the comments of the Facebook. And after we hear from Michaela, then we will um, answer some of your questions. Uh, but I do have a question. What is your outlook for the future of recycling patients? Um, I mean, I think it's healthy. I think our community is really lucky. You know, our clinic is not going anywhere. Gerdau and Maris deal is not going anywhere. West Rock. I mean, we have our own outlet for all the paper and all the cardboard. Cardboard prices are really high. Um, glass is trickier. Um, but we do have some promising options, I'm hoping, on the horizon for glass, a whole different avenue for glass. Um, so no, I think, I think it's healthy. I don't think we want to let down our guard and we do want to do everything that we can to, you know, keep our, keep our um, stream as pure as we can. Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think it's good. I don't think we need to worry too much that we're going to lose it. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, so um, just the, in the interest of props and uh, reinforcing the message, here's a number one plastic clamshell, which these, this came, some giant strawberries came in this container, and we all see these clamshells more and more on the, the store shelves, particularly with produce, but is this recyclable curbside in Knoxville, or is it trash in Knoxville? Number it one. is actually recyclable. They tell us it's recyclable, and I have heard that a lot, the clamshells can be an issue because of they're so light, they get tossed around. Um, so they're not easily captured, but you are fine to go ahead and put that in your bin. Excellent, that's great. Now, we all know the plastic bags, also known as film, you get it every time we go shopping, definitely a no-no for the- A big no, yeah. Now, if you have Publix in there, I'm sure some grocery stores that take the, in Kroger, that take plastic bags when you walk into the store, you can drop them in the plastic bag bin. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that we often overlook is that um, food waste, so we, I have my compost thing. Uh, we have our uh, food waste, which you got watermelon is my big food waste in the summertime, uh, the rinds and such. But um, if you put that in residential backyard composting, you can turn it into healthy topsoil mm -hmm. um, nutrition for your garden. So um, that is recyclable through the natural process of composting in your backyard, but not in your curbside bin. Absolutely. And I love that you have a, a button on your website. I'll go ahead and type that in unless you want to type it in the chat, patients. Uh, it was um, Knoxville. KnoxvilleTN.gov forward slash recycling is our general page or forward slash service and sort. Okay. And that is just the tool. But you can get to the tool from the, re the general recycling page. Yeah, service and sort is the, mm -hmm. the extension on that. Yeah, that's great. I love to see that you have a tool where you can enter any material you are quite, you don't know about and you mm -hmm. can get an answer straight from the expert. So that's a wonderful thing. I'm glad you had that feature. Uh, I will type in um, our Tennessee Environmental Council has a personalized heart scan where you can take a picture of your the top of your recycling cart and email it to us, uh, and we will our staff will look at it and let you know if there's anything in there we see you could do to improve your practice of recycling at home. It's a personalized cart um, survey or feedback that we provide for you, and I'll just type in um, that link in there as well. Um, but it's great to know that you have the resources right there on your city's website. Um, so recycle, right, Knoxville. So I'm putting that in the chat here. It will also be in the comments section of our Facebook Live as well. Uh, so there are plenty of resources. If you still don't know, there's always that question mark when, wait, is mm -hmm. this recyclable? Can I put this in my cart or not? And I, I mean, I, I ask that question every day myself. Um, I'm, but I love your, when you're, when in doubt, just put it in the trash, be safe. Mm -hmm. Don't contaminate the entire recycling stream. Um, but it's great to know that there's always a place for anybody to go if you have questions to have those answered for you. Mm -hmm. And so, and I also love that you had uh, on your 
in one of your slides how um, reduce is another key thing. So you recycle what you use, but reducing the amount of stuff going in the recycling stream or in the waste stream in general is a very important practice. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Michaela Barnett who founded and owns Knox Phil. Um, that's a nice play on words there, uh, Michaela, Knox Phil. So uh, you can, there's a lot of household project products and uh, I won't spoil, steal the thunder there, but there are a lot of things you, you use in your house that you can actually refill and not create more packaging waste. So uh, Michaela is the owner of Knox Phil and is also pursuing her PhD in behavioral science through which uh, Michaela is researching waste and sustainability. So you have a lot of experience in this field and I'm glad that um, this is becoming an entrepreneurial enterprise as well. So take it away, Michaela. Thank you so much. I'll get my screen pulled up and tell you that um, when I had the moment of epiphany about the name, I just was so pleased, right? It just, how can it be more apt? Yeah, um, All righty, exactly. So thanks for um, taking giving me some time to, to share my business with you all and patience. Thanks for such a wonderfully informative presentation. I'll follow up her plug for an AmeriCorps volunteer by telling you all that I was an AmeriCorps volunteer a few years ago and it's a wonderful program and I highly recommend it. So as mentioned, I'm currently getting my PhD from the University of Virginia and I research our waste system. The problems with it that patients talked about, the perceptions and the misperceptions that we have, and really the human behavioral elements of waste, because we're always interacting with it. And I've been obsessed with waste my entire life. My mom used to have us dig through the trash on the side of the road to find good stuff. I was that kid in high school, always sorting through. Um, so this is really a natural outgrowth of that passion. And you know, none of these images at this point are shocking to us. We all see these, we're all very overwhelmed by them. Um, but we really are solving problems, not just with disposal, but thinking about waste at the source from production to consumption. And as I spent so much time studying these issues from a theoretical perspective, I grew really frustrated um, that we do tend to think about waste more when we're throwing it away, recycling it or composting it, and not when we're purchasing the items or making the items that will eventually become waste. So that's where Knoxville comes in. I'm going to explain a little more about our business model to you all. You can see I'm in my storeroom right now. I've got a lot of bulk products behind me that can be refilled. Um, but Knoxville really exists to radically change the way we produce, consume, and dispose of goods. You know, we're all about progress over perfection. I'm not a perfect zero waster, and I don't expect any of my customers to be either, but we're making the more sustainable option accessible. Um, and really helping create a community around sustainability, which we're already so lucky to have in Knoxville. It's an amazing city with a lot of people who care about these, these problems, um, but helping get us all together in one place so that we can really transform our individual impact into a collective impact. And just to tell you the, the values of this company, um, you know, I started Knoxville because I really wanted someone to open a refillery in Knoxville. I had been getting zero waste goods shipped to me for years, which didn't seem very sustainable or zero waste. I kept waiting for someone to do it, looking enviously at refilleries and zero waste stores in other cities, um, and then realized, why not me? So that's where Knoxville came to be. And the guiding values of this company, as I mentioned before, are progress over perfection. We're not all gonna get it right, but I'm here to celebrate all small victories and people and planet over profit. So Knoxville is a refillery. Um, we currently don't have a storefront, it's all online. And we work just like the milkman used to work. So we bring you personal care and household goods in refillable, reusable containers that when are empty, you can order full ones and we swap you the full ones, take back your empties, 
clean, sanitize, and fill them back up for you and other customers. So it's completely circular, completely low waste. Um, and we also offset any transportation emissions associated with getting the goods to us um, and delivering them to you through a partnership um, with a forest in Middle Tennessee through the Clinch Valley Forest. So we're offsetting all of our emissions. Our back end of our supply chain is also sustainable and zero waste. Most of the products that you see behind me and these things that are called carboys come to us in plastic softer bladders um, that we put in here and then we send the empties back to our suppliers to be cleaned, refilled and sent back to us and to other refilleries. So it's zero waste in our supply chain as well. So in terms of how you can start getting your products from us, which includes everything from shampoo to lotion to vinegar, cleaners, and just about any other personal care or household good that you need, you can pick out everything you want online at our website, knoxville.com. Choose between pickup and delivery. We've got a few different options and currently delivery is limited to the Knoxville area. You can see which zip codes we're delivering to. Currently, we're a teeny tiny team, but growing all the time, small and mighty. So we're working to expand our delivery zones. Um, and then you'll get your order on your delivery day. If you picked delivery, it comes to you. If you picked pickup, you'll come get it from us. And then for subsequent orders, you'll just give us your empty containers and we'll give you full ones um, and just give those back to us in your Knoxville tote. So something that people ask me a lot is about our suppliers and where we're getting our products. Because um, I know that at this point in our life, we all have amazing products that like work well for our skin and our hair and our clothes and making the transition can sometimes be daunting. Um, so we evaluate all of our suppliers for quality, sustainability and equity along their supply chain and source locally wherever possible. Um, if you are a maker and you wanna supply goods to Knoxville, we have a form on our website that you can fill out. And I'm really proud of the businesses that we are able to partner with and the fact that we're investing back in small family owned, women owned businesses and also local businesses. I'm sure you all will have a lot more questions for both me and patients, but please do keep in touch. Our website is knoxville.com. Uh, we're on social media and here for email for any of your questions or any ideas that you have at knoxvilleshop at gmail.com. Um, and I will pass it back over to you, Jeffrey, for questions and Q&A session. Thank you, Michaela. It's great. And it's so nice to see uh, when you recognize there's a need in the world and you can step up and create a solution um, to meet that need. And uh, we appreciate the good work you're doing to reduce the amount of materials people consume. And we also appreciate you partnering with us on our new battery, alkaline battery recycling um, opportunity for folks. Now, um, this is, you have to be a customer of Knoxville. I've, hey, I've got, got the box here in the storeroom. So this is where your alkaline batteries will go when you give them to me. <laughs> hey, look at that beautiful cardboard box. <laughs> that's recyclable in and of itself, but it's offered and it's probably made out of 100% uh, post-consumer recycled cardboard, I'm guessing. Um, but it's from TerraCycle and uh, that we want to fill that box that Michaela just showed you with uh, alkaline batteries. And yeah, you can throw them in the trash, but like everything that is recyclable, you can throw it in the trash, but that's the whole point. We want to create a circular economy and there's a lot of valuable materials in uh, your average, um, this is not an advertisement for any company in particular, but uh, alkaline batteries are so prevalent now. I mean, there's like massive packs of these when you're checking out at the grocery store or at the Best Buy, wherever, Target, you know? So but these are alkaline batteries and we produce, we create a lot of them, throw a lot of these in the trash but they can be recycled. There's metal in there and there's other materials inside um, that can be re repurposed and reused and manufactured in new things. Uh, so um, we now offer alkaline batteries for anybody in Knoxville who wants to uh, go order online, become a member of Knoxville. 
And when you, uh, when Knoxville comes to your doorstep and picks up your stuff, they can pick up your alkaline batteries too. Uh, so, and we, um, in order to do it properly, um, when you dispose of these, um, please put some tape on the end. That's the um, guideline offered by TerraCycle who will be recycling these batteries uh, because electricity does flow through these if they're touching other things that are metal, which in a big box full of uh, batteries, it's very likely that there would be a lot of contact there. So tape the ends, sign up for a good fill and start recycling your alkaline batteries right there, um, no matter where you live in Knoxville. So right on. So I'm going to go ahead and see who's asking questions here and, and see if we can address a couple of questions. And one of the questions we have on our Q&A on our Zoom audience is that, um, this looks like for you patients, what, does the city of Knoxville have a method of letting residents know about changes to what's accepted? Is there a newsletter or other form of announcement? Funny you should ask, because just yesterday we had a meeting, a team meeting, um, and we're finalizing our first newsletter. Uh, we got a MailChimp account, so we will be sending out probably twice a year um, newsletter. And we collect email addresses. They're, it's optional, but we've been collecting them for about a decade uh, from our recyclers when they sign up. So I know there are going to be a lot of out of date emails, but we will soon, probably in the next week or two, add a button um, on our website so people can just go ahead and sign up and make sure that they're getting the newsletter. So yeah, we'll, we'll let everybody know about big changes. That's great. Uh, and when will people be able to sign up for that newsletter? I'm sorry, you probably just said that. Probably like a week or two. We literally, that's one of the last tasks of our outgoing AmeriCorps member is to figure out how to get it to feed right into that MailChimp. So it should be up shortly. Fantastic. And I'm going to go ahead and put in your, your um, I'm typing into the question, the answer to the question online with your website on there, knoxvilletn.gov slash recycling, because there's that button. You can always ask, is this, what can I do with this material? And how many, did, how many materials do you say are in there where you have answers? You said it was like a hundred. I'm not sure. I know it's in the hundreds though. It's in the hundreds. And again, they're not all, it's not all about recycling. Um, you know, the, you have a lot of those oddball like cooking oil and pesticides and all kinds of stuff that people might have questions about, but yeah, it's in the hundreds. That's great. Okay. That's amazing. How many materials there are. We just, just yeah. automatically <laughs> toss without thinking about it. Um, but it's time to start thinking a little bit more. And by the way, you, the choices are all day, every day. I mean, we go, you go to the store, you're about yeah. to buy that dozen eggs. There's a dozen that comes in a cardboard recyclable container. There's a dozen that comes in a, a plastic clamshell. Well, now in Knoxville, you can recycle both in curbside. So that's great. Um, in mm -hmm. Nashville, our curbside does not accept those clamshells. So that's a uh -huh. decision point. Now, mm -hmm. you have a choice on the store shelf between plastic clamshell and cardboard recyclable or styrofoam now we know styrofoam is not recyclable so you have a choice every time you're shopping by making that one simple change you're going from something that cannot be recycled to something that can be so mm -hmm. that's uh, that's where the decisions are made when you're when you're shopping uh, almost yeah. exclusively uh, that's the starting point at least and another question for patients what is um I'm, I'm assuming that you there's separation of colors of glass at the recycling centers. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why is that? So um, the price of different glass, there's different prices for different glass. Um, and I think it was, was it the green that was higher? Um, right now, it's not enough of a difference. There is a, still a difference in price, but there's not enough of a difference that it makes sense um, to separate them in the truck. So right now people are sorting them, but they're all thrown into the same truck right now because there isn't that financial benefit right now. Again, those markets go up and down, but with something like that, you don't want to tell people to stop segregating it because these things can change. So. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. And, and there are different materials in each color. So uh, mm -hmm. there are different end uses and different processes to actually right cycle those glass materials. Mm -hmm. so, um, and a, a, a question for, uh, from Michaela, what, um, what's your outlook on the future of establishing a truly circular economy in our region? Yeah, that's a great question. So, 
You know, I really appreciated Patience's systems approach that recycling is part of a strategy towards a circular economy, but it's not the whole strategy. And I think that's when we get into trouble when we treat it like it is this panacea, um, particularly for things like plastic, where recycling is just deferred going to the landfill in our region and in other places that could be going to incinerators or becoming plastic pollution in the natural environment. But I have to say that starting this business has made me feel more like a climate and environmental optimist than I have in years. Mm -hmm. The community is so hungry and ready for alternatives. And I know that a refill model is also just another small part towards this circular economy. I'm providing alternatives for things that usually come in packaging designed to be disposed of. Um, but I really think where the big change is going to come is from the level of policy and larger corporations adopting these models. And hopefully small companies like mine can show bigger companies that it is possible, that customers do want this, they are excited about it, and that it is viable from an environmental sustainability perspective and a social and economic one as well. So I'm I'm more optimistic than I've been in a long time. After a year plus, that's been really hard for a lot of us. We've we've gone through a lot. I'm um I'm feeling like a circularity optimist, and that feels like a really good thing to say. That's wonderful, mm -hmm. um, and great. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's great to hear uh, for someone who's devoted her life uh, and both of you to solving these challenges to improving our environment. And we, we're just so pleased to be collaborating with you in many different ways and, and hope to continue the journey with you. Um, thanks for being a pioneer uh, for both of you in your own ways. We did, uh, we, the last thing we have here on our Q&A is from Mary, who said, no question right now, just a huge thank you, thank you, thank you for all y'all are doing. Uh, so um, it's really good to hear that. Uh, there is a lot of room for optimism and hope and inspiration and you've provided some of that for me here today and we hope um, we've done the same for those viewing this and it will be posted on our um, and our on our YouTube page and we'll put it back out to the community through Facebook as well. Awesome. Thanks, Wonderful. Sarah. Do you yeah, have any closing thank you words, Kayla? Uh, anything else you want to say before we adjourn? Just to thank you for for setting up this venue and helping get the word out. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. You're welcome. It goes both ways. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you for the good work. And let's, uh, let's change the world, y'all. <laughs> let's do it. Take care.